This week, I'm very happy to welcome the very popular ESPN host and broadcaster for the NHL. I think I can call you a friend now, Arda Okal. Arda, how's it going? I'm good, Johnny. How are you, man? Do people call you Artie as like a, a nickname or what's your, uh, you got to have a hockey lingo nickname now. I don't, I don't have a hockey lingo. I should probably have one at some point, but uh, no, I think art is like such a unique. It rolls name off the tongue. Like, yeah, it's kind of yeah. like, that's kind of a nickname in itself. Like mm -hmm. I already have a name that nobody else really has in hockey. So it's almost like, yeah, yeah. Just keep that. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> but I, I, guess guess I don't know. Oaksy. Like, I don't, I have no idea. I have no idea what my hockey name would be. I, I don't know. Yeah. You'd maybe we'll give you one by new. the end. Like it was actually, Actually, it's kind of funny that you mentioned this. I was listening to a podcast about uh, 90s goaltenders. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was from, I think it was the score that put it on. I used to work there too a long time ago. And uh, there was one story there in the Curtis Joseph episode where like the Blues were thinking for like 45 minutes on what to name him. They're like, we can't call him Joey. We can't call him Curtis. You know what I mean? Like they were thinking uh -huh. they were workshopping names. And then like Cujo came out like after like, 45 minutes of brainstorming at like Great a name. dinner and it's like that's like the one of the greatest nicknames ever in hockey yeah. right so like sometimes you got to think outside the box we haven't gotten there yet Our, we're, we're sticking with Arda for now I guess yeah. but you know who knows one day it's funny too I I mean this kind of just like popped in my head but I remember watching 24 7 like Road to the Winter Classic I think it was Bruins Blackhawks and Tori Krug on the Bruins obviously and then Mason Kruger on the Blackhawks like their last names and nicknames were like kind of switched. So like the Bruins called Tory Krug Kruger and the Blackhawks called uh, Mason Kruger Krug. It was like kind of weird yeah. how it worked, but um, exactly. You can't use the same. You can't use yeah. the exact last name. You gotta you gotta change it up. No, yeah, definitely not. And and I want to kind of jump into the ESPN stuff right away. I mean, you've always been a guy. I feel like that wants to bring out the personalities. You know, kind of like myself. I I like to think I'm similar to you in the fact that you know I'm not here to spit facts and you know, talk about numbers and percentages and all that stuff. But I just like to talk to people that truly just love the game and, and make the game more fun. So for you, how much fun has this year been so far being with ESPN? And I know you made your uh, debut on The Point last week. Yeah, so I, I, I've done a couple now. I did one like the first week of The Point when it was uh, every day leading up to the season. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun. Hosting games has been an absolute blast. Like this is an absolute dream gig for me. Like I, mm -hmm. this is exactly what I would want to do with my career. You know, I get to do uh, a bunch of hockey coverage. I get to host games. I get to host in the crease. I get to fill in on the point. I get to do other content for hockey because it's, you know, my favorite sport. And I get to also on the, uh, fill in on sports centers as needed. So, I mean, that's, that's a dream gig for anyone who really wants to aspire to be a sports broadcaster who happens to love hockey, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I have no complaints whatsoever. It's been an amazing ride and you know like the nhl being back on espn uh is is been a dream come true because there's been a, there's a lot of hockey fans it's, it's one funny thing it's almost like people come up to me sometimes and they say oh isn't it great to be able to talk about hockey again and it's like we never stopped yeah. yeah we haven't yeah. stopped talking about hockey it's just all of a sudden we have a larger megaphone to talk about hockey like there are a ton of hockey fans at espn believe you me like there are like conversations about hockey have been happening for years and years and years because there are a ton of fans it's just now we are a rights holder and you know the the, the landscape has changed that's what's different so i i also want to say as a, a viewer i'm a huge fan of the point and for me like you know i obviously the last like 10 years or so i wake up have a coffee and watch Stephen a smith on first take and the point is kind of obviously it's that three o'clock eastern not you know 10 a.m which maybe we can work on in the future because i'd love to wake up to some hockey talk but um, it's so breathtaking, not breathtaking. It's so uh, refreshing, I guess is the word um, to just have people kind of not necessarily, you know, talk about what's trending in the league in like such a professional way, but more so shoot the shit about hockey. And that's like, I feel like what you guys are maybe aiming for. And are we going to maybe see it more often? Or is the point going to stick to like a once a week kind of show? I, I would imagine like, I don't, I'm not in these conversations, but mm -hmm. I would imagine that around, I guess, big times of year, like, does the point increase uh, in terms of number of shows a week during the playoffs? Maybe uh, it, it was definitely once a day at the beginning of the season at, at launch point. So if you're going off of that and strictly that, that could very well happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know because I'm not in those conversations, like I said, but if I were to guess educated guess, maybe, but 
I mean, just the fact that a show like The Point exists and, you know, uh, we will have more announcements about shows uh, on digital. Like, for example, the first day of the regular season, we did a digital show on ESPN's Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, called The Drop, mm -hmm. uh, which was myself and Greg Wyshynski. And fans can look forward to that returning at some point. And maybe there'll be more shows like that, you know? So there's definitely a lot of content on the horizon. And I'll say, like, even in hosting the point last week, to your point, there's a lot of great storytelling that's happening yeah. that normally wouldn't have a place anywhere else. We aired last week when I filled in, we aired a 12-minute, I call it a mini documentary yeah. on Jack Hughes. Like, it was, it, it was a very, very substantial feature on Jack Hughes and you got a really great glimpse into his personality and how he interacts with his teammates, especially his roommate, Ty Smith. And there were some funny moments in there about how he can't cook broccoli, broccoli but yeah. then there's also conver there's also stuff about his on ice play and how he's been, you know, his development in the league and how he's been enjoying that journey and some of the challenges, et cetera. Like it was a really substantial piece. And the point is a perfect place to tell those kind of stories. And, you know, for, for me being part of the team, it's like, this is awesome that we can find these stories, tell these stories, talk to people and, and, and really bring this out because that's what hockey fans want and crave. And yeah. now we finally have an opportunity to do this for them. Yeah, I thought Emily Kaplan absolutely crushed that feature. Um, it was it was really entertaining. I actually watched it twice. Um, just because I've become a fan of Jack Hughes. I think he's an awesome kid, awesome for the game. But let me kind of ask you on top of that. If you could do a feature on one player right now, who would you want to do a 12 minute piece on? I I mean, I feel like one of the big stories this year, uh, or at least like something that we consistently talk about, but it feels a little bit different this year, I should say, is hockey culture. I feel yeah. like, I mean, uh, uh, Emily also did a feature, uh, ESPN cover story on Austin Matthews at the start mm -hmm. of the year. That had a lot of co hockey culture conversation in it. Jack Hughes, Trevor Zegris. Adam Fox, you know, there are a lot of players that you could point to that say, you know, they're making contributions and trying to help shift the paradigm. You know, I, I love this story, for example, of Jack Hughes scoring in overtime, throwing a stick over the glass, but then him and Jack Hughes having a, pardon me, uh, him and Trevor Zegris yeah. having a text message, uh, texting back and forth saying, hey, if I do the Zegris going, if I score in overtime and do the exact same thing, lo and behold, it happens, you know, like I, I, I love those little stories or the, um, uh, there's many, many stories like that, that you hear about that. You just, it just warms your heart. Like it just like, okay, I, for everyone that's talking about, ah, oh, traditional hockey and believe me, there is definitely a place for tradition in hockey. There's definitely some things, uh, that should absolutely be revered and kept, but that does, that's not to say there's not a happy medium to be able to express yourself and your personality in certain things. I'm a big fan of abolishing the dress code. I don't think that players need to show up in a suit and tie if they don't want to. That's just me. That's just my personal opinion. Everyone can have an opinion. Like Miles Bridges in the NBA showing up in a Darth Vader costume. I uh -huh. thought that was awesome. Same. I don't Are have you... a problem with that at all. I, is that going to contribute to the downfall of the team? No. No. So like, I, I mean, things like that, in my humble opinion, there's definitely places where we can relax a little bit on what people would label as quote unquote hockey culture or traditional hockey culture or whatever the case may be. But I will say this with the players like we just talked about that are really talking about it, bring it to the forefront consistently. I do think that it's relaxing. I do see a change and I do think that we're getting there step by step. It's not as quickly as people might want, but it's definitely on that path. Are you a big NBA fan as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love, I love, I mean, just as much the product on the court as what's happening around the court. I love um, social uh, NBA social media is fascinating to me yeah. because there's so many funny people that are, you know, posting about the NBA and also how the players act and, 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 and how they're interacting with the media and what kind of content they're putting out, et cetera. Like, I find that all to be absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I'm a huge NBA fan also. I'm a big Knicks fan. Um, but I actually, so I touched on this a little bit in my last episode, just talking about, you know, Jack Hughes, these like young personalities and how it's so different with NBA players versus NHL players. And I, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I kind of want to get your opinion on it. I think it's so wild that John Morant, listen, NBA all-star, unreal player, second overall draft pick, 
has 4.5 million followers on Instagram. Jack Hughes, 334,000. Like the difference between the following in, in an NBA superstar and an NHL superstar is wild. And I, I think you can appreciate that as a content guy. So, you know, what are these young guys necessarily like Zegris, uh, Hughes? I know Foxy isn't like so active on Instagram, but like just to get their popularity uh, a little bit risen throughout the entire country, not only like within the hockey culture, hockey community, like how do these guys really gain so much popularity? Is it is it fashion? Is it like being on TV? Like how do they really do that? Because I, I don't really have an answer for it. Well, I mean, the first thing we should point out is that the NBA is a juggernaut in terms yeah. of sports, right? In particular, in terms of popularity, especially over the last decade, 15, 20 years, you look at the rise of popularity of the NBA, mm -hmm. uh, it has definitely exploded. And the NHL is, is, is not, it's, it's like, it's not, you can't compare the two in terms of popularity in the United States. That's just a fact. That's just yeah. the way that it is. And so by virtue of that, the stars of the NBA will no doubt have a lot more attention than the stars in the NHL. But that's not to say that the NHL can't grow and those stars can and those stars can't be found. Also, one of the going back to that conversation about hockey culture, you know, there's there's always that there's always the thought of hockey players shouldn't say the word I. The the crest on the front of your jersey is more important than the name on the back of your jersey. In the NBA, that sort of personality, that sort of outward expression is encouraged mm -hmm. and is it, the, the culture, it, 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 it allows for that. It, it, it supports that. And I'm not saying that that's not necessarily the case in the NHL, but I believe we will eventually get to a point where that kind of expression will be encouraged. And I think that that will help as well, because as we know, social media Really, if you want to grow your social media following, you have to be consistent, you have to be creative, you have to be informative, you have to be funny. Like there are certain buckets that you can notice people growing their social media followings. Why do you follow people on social media? The very small percentage of people is because they're celebrities and you're just yeah. interested in them as human beings and you want to know what they're up to, right? But then maybe similarly to athletes, like, okay, I want to follow... Um, Connor McDavid on Instagram because he's Connor McDavid, or I want yeah. to follow Hillary Knight on, on social media because she's Hillary Knight, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. But like for other people, there's, there's reasons, right? Like if I'm, uh, I don't know, a third line center and I'm not, <laughs> I don't necessarily have that cachet. What if I'm con uh, consistently posting on social media? What if I'm putting interesting things behind the scenes that fans can't see? What if I'm funny? What if I'm engaging? Like there are always these hooks, these reasons for people to follow you, right? But that comes with uh, the, the the culture too. Like yeah. it's it needs to be an, a, a collaborative, inclusive culture of you're not going to be shamed necessarily for posting on social media frequently or, or whatever the case may be, right? Like we're getting to a point where that's going to happen in hockey, where that this kind of, it will be encouraged at some point. It may not be sooner than later uh, or sooner than people will have hoped, but I do believe we're going to get there eventually. Yeah. I, I think uh, a huge advocate for that too. I mean, it might not be like the most glamorous of posting, but you know, Robin Leonard has done, an incredible yeah. job just like speaking out. And and I uh, I got a chance to read uh, Jess Granger's story today on him. I don't know if, if, you, if you caught that, but like that's another difference too, right? Like I, I hate to like keep going back to the NBA, but you know, Kevin Love like gets up off the bench in the middle of the game and like goes to the locker room because he's have, like, having an anxiety attack where, you know, Robin Leonard is a guy who obviously has been battling with mental health illness. But, um, you know, I feel like just hockey toughness would, if, if he got up off, you know, off the ice in the middle of a game, that could like ruin his career. I don't even know. You know, it's just such the, a different. You know, the 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 concept of ho like being a hockey guy or yeah. hockey toughness, right? Like you said, yeah. uh, that certainly is a thing. We anybody listening to this, watching this right now, knows exactly what we're talking about when we say he's a hockey guy. Yeah, he's hockey tough. We they know as soon as we say this, right? Mm -hmm. Like you understand it. The perfect example. Oh, that person uh, lost a tooth, didn't miss a shift. This person needed stitches, came right back on the bench. Yeah. This person got a gash on their leg from a skate. They're right back on the ice. Like that sort of hockey toughness, right? Now, some of those situations, we can credit that to, to toughness and okay, they're fine to continue to play. But other situations, like one big change, for example, 
uh, the concern for for head trauma, right? Like what happens in the NHL now uh, in terms of concussion protocol, vastly different than what happened in the quote unquote old days, decades ago, whatever the case may be, right? Like the game evolves and changes and maybe that paradigm of what we consider to be quote unquote hockey tough will also change because we realize that at the end of the day, we want these athletes to be in tip top optimal condition, optimal being the word here, because we want them to play for very long careers Mm -hmm. because we want to watch the best play against the best. And so that definition is fluid too. That could look vastly different five years from now than it does today. It's funny that you say that too, because probably my favorite NHL call of all time, which I'm sure you're going to maybe agree with, but the off the floor on the board, Paul Korea, if that hit happens today, he's not coming back in that game. No, no way. Exactly. Doctors no, would not let him not. back. Right. And we look back on that moment because he scored a goal. And I mean, to hear him talk about it now is, yeah. is definitely a lesson learned though, because like he talks about how he doesn't remember much from the game, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And like, that's scary to think about now, knowing what we know, uh, about about head trauma and concussions, right? So what I will say is I, I think that we are getting to, we're eventually going to get to a place where the athletes will feel safe. The, the paradigm is in a place where it needs to be. And we are all still enjoying the game as much as we do. Yeah. I, I want to shift gears and talk about some fun stuff. I know we got a little uh, little serious there, but um, you spent some time with MSG covering the Rangers and the Devils, and I didn't even know prior to this that you were a Rangers fan. So can you talk about your time like covering the Rangers, being at MSG, and um, just kind of your experience in New York? Yeah, so I joined MSG Networks after. So I moved to the States uh, when I got a job at WWE, of all places. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years. And I missed sports, honestly. And so after I left WWE, I knocked on some doors. I had a lot of hockey experience in my background. All, at the very beginning of my career, I wanted to do hockey. But uh-huh. in Canada, I, I, I got a lot of advice from different people saying, maybe you should pursue um, an off-the-beaten-path track because there's so many people that want to do hockey in Canada, even if mm-hmm. one position became available, there would be 40, 50, 60 people behind that person that would be lobbying for those jobs. And so for someone starting out, it would be extremely difficult to even crack the egg of hockey yeah. in Canada. So I took the wrestling route and uh, that worked out for me. But after that ended, uh, I wanted to get back into sports, in particular hockey. So the MSG Networks gig came up. Uh, luckily, the timing worked out fantastic. They were launching a new show called the MSG Hockey Show, uh, and we ended up doing that for two seasons. It was myself and Anson Carter and Will Reeve, uh, and it was a blast. We had a, a lot of fun. It came on after Rangers games and, and and Devils Islanders Sabres as well. And then through there, I got connected with the Rangers and the Devils organizations, and I did different things for them for the for the next few years. Uh, with the Rangers in particular, I did the whole 2017 playoff run uh, where I was basically there activation host i I did a i forget the name of it someone can tell me on twitter Um, (laughs) Uh it was a big tent with a whole bunch of activations there was a vr station there was a big stage right on the street where we did a whole bunch of alumni conversations and uh it was a lot of fun there were you know a whole bunch of alumni for fans to meet etc it was a blast and i was there every game i actually got on the i think it was the new york daily news when rick nash scored in overtime and i was like in the background like ah you can see me like right against the glass it was like Uh really funny very randomly so uh yeah it was it was a ton of fun and i i I kept in touch with the rangers and kept doing events on and off with them uh uh, still today honestly like every now and then i'll pop in and do a one-off event but uh, yeah, no, it was a ton of fun. And there also is where I started to do the NHL Gaming World Championship, which was sort of like my, the marriage of two things that I love, video games mm-hmm. and hockey. So uh, that's, that's been a blast as well. And uh, yeah, no, it's been great. Uh, MSG was really, really good to me. I even did some Knicks uh, 150s, uh, which were, which were mm-hmm. a blast. And uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I, nothing but great memories from my MSG days. I feel like we're a little spoiled as Rangers fans with just the talent that we have at MSG. I mean, you know, when I watch the Knicks, well, Clyde Frazier and Mike Breen are arguably the best duo in basketball. And then hockey as well, Sam Rose and Joe Micheletti, um, you know, John Giannone, Bill Pito, those guys are awesome. And even like the Devils and Islanders have 
great broadcasting teams as well. I mean, I yeah. feel like every MSG broadcaster also does national coverage too. Like it's kind of crazy how, like even basketball as well. Um, but I, I did want to ask you about the gaming stuff. I don't really have so much experience in it. Um, you know, I play like NHL every now and then, but I don't really get the whole competitive gaming world. So can you kind of describe like what you're doing in the gaming world right now? Yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's uh, basically, I mean, esports is exploding. I mean, uh -huh. it, it's exploding in the sense that more people are understanding what it is. There's scholarships are, for it, right? Exactly. Like it's yeah. starting to get into the college realm. They're starting to be. I wouldn't be surprised if we see varsity esports teams uh, at every school in the next 15, 20 years. Like I, I do feel like uh, this is a realm where people are really starting to understand it or at least acknowledge it now as opposed to laugh it off, right? Yeah. Like there's a generation of people, myself included, that grew up with video games as a hobby. But now huh. there's a whole generation, at least two or three of them, that grew up with video games as a viable career path yeah. to play them or create content with video games, which is absolutely amazing. And so with the NHL Gaming World Championship, it's basically the top level competition for uh, the EA NHL game that comes out every year. And the NHL puts on a tournament uh, and it's, you know, a large prize pool of 50 grand, 60, 70 grand, whatever the, whatever the total prize pool is. And uh, a world champion is crowned, at least for the first two seasons. And obviously the pandemic hit and mm -hmm. uh, the, the championships became regional. But, but yeah, no, that's been a, that's been a blast. I mean, I, I, I applaud the NHL for, getting into that bubble uh, and trying to encourage teams to put on different events as well. Uh, actually, the Rangers almost did. Let me show yeah. you this. So this is a, uh, this is a Rangers gaming, uh, a one of one. This is mm -hmm. the only one that exists. Uh, I definitely may or may <laughs> not have five finger discounted this from uh -huh. the, uh, from the set. Maybe I asked permission, you know, I'm not going to confirm or deny that why I have this, but uh, this was going to be an event for the Rangers. It was going to be their official Rangers esports event, and it never happened. Uh, and I, I'm not sure why. I actually have no idea why. I know they, I know there were plans for it to happen, uh, but it never did. It ended up being an activation uh, with a couple of Rangers players. I think like Brady Shea was involved, uh, and they ended up playing video games against. I think it was the Knicks gaming team, uh, which was still a lot of fun. But um, yeah, so. Now Rangers fans know at least there were thoughts about doing an esports event, but I wouldn't be surprised in the future if the Rangers put on an event where they bring in, hey, like if you think you're good at this game, come compete in our tournament kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I will say that we probably would have that the esports ecosystem in the NHL particularly probably would be a lot farther along if not for COVID. But I think uh, once it's once we feel safer to come yeah. together for events, I think that will hit the ground running again. I hate that I'm going to ask this, but on top of like the esports and and like virtual kind of stuff, I, I've just been learning about the metaverse. Yeah. I don't know if you've looked into it at all. Um, so like I actually saw like Reese Witherspoon tweet about it today, like how you know in the near future, I guess uh, there's going to be like everything's going to be through crypto and we're going to have our own like on like online virtual personalities or something like that. And I, I haven't asked anyone really about it, but I feel like you'll have some good insight. So I guess like, you know, five, 10 years from now, are we going to be like watching the NHL, like virtual reality? Like I feel like so, you have something good here. <laughs> great, great question. So, uh, okay. So those are two different things. So the metaverse, yeah. and I won't get too deep in the rabbit hole here. Uh, I highly encourage everyone. If you're interested in understanding what this all means, go and learn about it. We're still in the very early stages of like mainstream adoption of what the metaverse is to understand it. Basically, it's all virtual existence is, is the best way to put it. But we'll leave it at that for the metaverse. <laughs> Do your own research. Uh -huh. at, least, at least watch a couple of YouTube videos to understand exactly what, it, what people are talking about. I do recommend that. What I will say is this about how we will consume sports. So I... When I, I did a podcast at MSG Networks, and one of my guests was a guy by the name of Blake J. Harris. He wrote a book uh, about the history of video games, but his next project was about virtual reality and the history of it, but what is also to come. And he said, which has stuck with me, and I, and I can now absolutely see this happening, is he said, in the near future, it could still be 5, 10 years, whatever the case may be. But in the near future, there will exist a world where through virtual reality, you will put on a helmet and you will all of a sudden be sitting at Madison Square Garden. You will have a virtual ticket. 
you will have the exact angle as if you're sitting in that seat. Wow. But not only will you be able to see exactly what you would see sitting in that seat, you would also hear everything exactly the same, but you would also smell everything. Like, and it would almost be like a complete recreative experience as if you are actually sitting there. Like it would be like a completely immersive, I am at MSG, I can see the roof, I feel, I smell, I sense. Like that's how he described it. He's like, you will be able to have that exact experience of going to the game at home. That Which is so to wild. me is like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, so wild. that's amazing. Like, yeah. can you imagine? Like, I mean, even just think of it from a company perspective. Like if I, if I'm a team, like all of a sudden, am I selling season tickets through VR now? Is that a whole extra arena that I'm selling? Does that get connected to the people that buy the physical tickets? Like, what will that look like? How will it feel? Like, trust me, VR has made leaps and bounds of improvement since, you know, even five years ago, like the, the, what you're able to experience now is astounding. Like mm -hmm. I, 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 I play VR often and, and I'm like, like fascinated by it because I do feel like this is the future, like of, of gaming, but also of sports consumption. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is, it's not there yet, but it's definitely on its way. But you're still going to have to go to the physical MSG to get that famous Madison Square Garden popcorn. <laughs> yeah. They yeah, won't bring exactly. you that. They won't bring exactly. you that at home. No, unfortunately, unless you buy, go and buy your own. Exactly. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's so weird to think about, though. I mean, like, I'm definitely going to get off topic here. Now we're talking about like real, real world stuff, just, you know, for like a quick second here. But I feel like the last 10 years, everything with technology has been built to like bring people together. And now we're just going in the opposite direction. Like, I don't want to sit on my couch with a helmet on and like not talk to my friends or parents like watching the well, game actually i think they the the whole idea would be that they would also be in their homes and you would be with them it's almost as if you're sitting beside each other and you're still having that collaborative yeah you're still uh -huh. having that shared experience and you're able to talk to them and see them beside you oh you I can see them that, beside you yeah so like imagine you're sitting here but like you can still see people in the arena so those people Whoa. They're in there. Yeah. So like you're seeing, Whoa. let's say your dad beside you and you're yeah. seeing your friend beside you. Right. So like those, that would be the experience, except you're a little bit more comfortable because you're not like scrunched yeah. into a seat, I guess. My mind is like, and, and it doesn't smell like beer and like pee next to you probably, but <laughs> my mind is like spinning. That depends right where you are in your house, I guess. I guess. You, <laughs> that's more Nassau Coliseum anyway, but that building's done. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's wild. My head is like spinning. I, I mean, I just can't like wrap my head because I've obviously been looking into it for like work and they're talking sure. about how you're going to have like a, you know, your own like virtual person at work and you can have like a virtual meeting. But that's besides the point. Oh, yeah. Know. No, that's a whole yeah. other conversation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. People, if you're if you play <laughs> video games, you already have this familiarity of it. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Like avatars with like different outfits and skins, et cetera. Like people, if you're let's say you play Fortnite or Minecraft or whatever you play, uh -huh. you already understand this concept. You okay. know what I mean? Like you yeah. are already very well aware. The other thing is like NFTs. People talk about NFTs all the time. That's like a buzzword now. What is an NFT? What is this mm. thing? It's a digital collectible. I can't hold it in my hands. What the heck is this thing? Don't don't be surprised if in the future, and you're already seeing teams start to experiment with this, but don't be surprised if all of a sudden your ticket to go into a game is a digital ticket yeah. and it's a collectible, right? Like if I had a ticket from game seven of the 94 Stanley Cup final, right? Mm -hmm. I could probably sell that for a pretty penny if I wanted to. Like I'd probably yeah. keep it because I love to, as you can tell, I like to collect stuff, but yeah. like, I'd probably, I could probably sell that on eBay and get a pretty decent amount, right? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing with NFTs, eventually, like you're going to get a ticket, let's say, and it might have a highlight on it from the game, or it might have a moment or some sort of uniqueness to it that then you can either keep and collect yourself or you can sell that as well. The beauty of the NFT is that there'll always be a ledger on what it was sold for, how many times, what day and to whom. So you'll always know with that, with that ticket stub, you may never know. Yeah. So like, anyway, we're getting deep into the yeah, whole yeah. NFT rabbit <laughs> yeah. hole here, but anyway, I wish I'm I did a have a game seven ticket stub. I do have this though, actually. Hold on. Let me show you. This was one of my keepsakes from MSG given to me by the uh, Rangers executive team. This is a VHS tape. Wow. Of uh, game seven. I think it's the whole run. Oh, wow. And it says hosted by uh, Sam Rosen, John Davidson, and Al Troutwick. How about that? 
How that's about the so Holy cool. Trinity of, of uh, old school Rangers commentary? That's like that's awesome. like, that is the trifecta right there. Right. Yeah. That's good. And stuff. it has Messier on it with who I now work with, which is like absolutely surreal. That's I was going to ask you about that, that too, that actually. There, there you go. That's no. cool. Also VHS tape. Anyone knows what a VHS tape is these days? <laughs> it's like, it's like the <laughs> oldest of like, this is amazing. I love you probably sell that for it. some good money too, though. I am not selling. Yeah, Are you I, kidding me? Yeah. I, I would keep this forever. No way. I wouldn't recommend it, but I want to make me an offer on Twitter. Actually, I'm just kidding. I'm not selling, not for sale. I used to, uh, as a kid, you'll appreciate this probably. I I had like the iPod nano with the first one that had like video (laughs) on it. Yeah. And I had the, I didn't have a TV in my room growing up. So I only had game seven 94, like video on my, uh, I beautiful. And I, I like need to fall asleep to like TV or like some kind of thing, like with my eyes open, uh, just how I am. (laughs) Just game seven. I would only watch game seven on my, on my iHome or whatever. I'd plug it into the iHome and just watch game seven every night to fall asleep. It was kind of wild, but, um, I, you, you mentioned Mark Messi. I just got to ask, like, yeah. obviously, you know, ESPN has a very talented NHL roster right now. And you're just like surrounded by hockey celebrities pretty much every day. I mean, I don't know if you're in the office every day, but, um, are you ever in awe of just the people that you work with right now? I, I love our team. I uh-huh. think that ESPN brought together a collection of incredible hockey talent smart know the game very well uh well researched well respected it's it's a it's a fantastic team from the hosts to the analysts the reporters it, it's been an absolute blast to be surrounded by them i i often were i mean i work with even last Thursday, you know, like I was just sitting and doing uh, cut-ins, which is basically studio mm-hmm. updates, basically, you know, giving updates around the league on uh, on the game on ESPN. And I was sitting in studio with with Linda Conan and Mess, and uh, just just to hear them talk hockey, you know, is 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 a treat, mm-hmm. and to just hear stories about uh, Mark Messier's career, uh, he. So uh, um, I think it was Matt Boldy for the wild that scored yeah. his first, first NHL goal. Mm-hmm. And so I asked uh, Mark, I said, Hey, Mess, do you remember your first NHL goal? He was like, yep, I was on my mother's birthday and I scored it against Rogi Vashon. <laughs> and I'm like, man, wow. like you've had so many, the guy won six Stanley cups. He's like the greatest leader in sports history. One of the greatest NHL players ever, but you never forget your first NHL goal, right? Like it's just one of those things that you never forget. And so that was kind of cool. And, and then, and then they uh, brought it up on the broadcast, which was neat too. But yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I listen, like I not, it is not lost on me that I'm living a, a charmed existence, uh, you know, being able to be around such great hockey minds. Like I, I have done many broadcasts with John Tortorella now. And like, I just feel so much smarter about <laughs> hockey when I leave, you know, like he's a wonderful, like we, and oftentimes we don't even talk about hockey, like just the, He'll, he'll tell me about, you know, we'll just talk about life. And uh, he's a big, um, he's big on um, horses and, and, and rescuing horses. We talk about that a lot. And, you know, j- but just like the hockey part of it, it's just like the way that they think about the game helps me look at the game like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I'm grateful to that because it makes me more analytical and, and, and more of a, uh, the, you know, to way to parse the game and to think about the game. So yeah, I am completely blessed in that regard. It's so funny too to think about like I I just crack myself up and this is maybe like a loserish thing to say just about myself, but like just thinking about like a you know ESPN NHL like Slack. I don't know if you guys use Slack or anything, <laughs> but like, like like a group chat, like you know like you're oh, I'm running five minutes late late torts, like hang on and you know just John Twitter like replying. The to first Slack. actually the yeah. funny thing is the first <laughs> the first time like I had no idea that Torts had joined us uh-huh. uh, on ES because he wasn't part of the uh, original press release where it was like that you know like 30 yeah. people or whatever got announced so how i learned about this was they over the summer we had a giant zoom call of like all the talents and all the producers and so i was just like scrolling through the names and then it's and, and all of a sudden <laughs> one pops up john tortorella and i'm like john tortorella like what's going on here and then all of a sudden five seconds later the video pops up and i'm like Torts is with us now. Like it was like such a, I was like, okay, yeah. awesome. That's yeah, so it was cool. like such a such a funny moment. But like, yeah, that's how I how I learned about it on Zoom. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, he's he's the best. I mean, 
even uh you know i was actually texting with emily a little bit just like in preparation for this i wanted to get some funny stories and she was saying how uh to ask about how torts chose boxed mac and cheese over uh chicken parm i guess oh yeah so at the end of the the point he there's like a what will he eat kind of thing and obviously with bucci the whole chicken parm and so Uh that's usually part of it so since he wasn't there uh, we thought, well, maybe we'll just change up the food. So when he comes out, so I didn't know that he was a big mac and cheese fan. I had no uh-huh. clue. And so when they did the big reveal, uh, I looked at it and I was like, mac and cheese. <laughs> like, I love mac and cheese. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Like, I'm a big mac and cheese fan. I feed it to my daughter all the time. And uh, but it looked like boxed mac and cheese. So he's like, he's loving it. He's like, yes, let's go. Like he's clapping and he's just (laughs) loving it. So like the funny part of that is, so we start eating it and I, um, he's, and then he also mentions on the show, like, oh yeah, I love uh, chopping up hot dogs and putting it into my mac and cheese as well. Like, it sounds like such a college thing to do, but it's something I totally do. You know (laughs) what I mean? It's a college thing. Mac and cheese. I don't know. You didn't do that at college, mac and cheese and hot dogs. Like you're kind of like a starving student and you're just like, I'm going to look for like, you know, that and ramen noodles. I don't know. That's what I did yeah. in college. Maybe that actually puts hot dogs and know. beans. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. But like, but like mac and cheese, like, you know, I mean, I even asked them off camera, like the best part of the whole thing was off camera when the show ended. So we're eating it and I'm like, so wait, you would rather this like cra- like boxed mac and cheese over like gourmet pasta and like high end cheese. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, really? Like actually box mac and cheese better. He's <laughs> yeah. like, yes. And I'm like, with no ketchup and nothing. And then he stops and he's like, just shut up and eat it. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. So we just ate it. It was hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> I, I guess while we're on that topic too, because I, I love asking people that, um, you know, do live TV or just like on on live air, um, you got to treat your body just like an NHL player would. And, and you know, you can't just like go to the bathroom, you know, during live air. So <laughs> like, have you ever had any funny stories where you just like, you know, can't hold in anything and you got to go to the bathroom like while you're recording or while you're live. I've definitely uh, had I've, I've held it in during Sports Center. Uh-huh. This is like my favorite uh, yeah, question to ask, by the way. I, that, I love is, this it, so it, that was rough. That was the worst <laughs> Sports Center I ever did. It was a Saturday morning <laughs> and it was a three hour shift. Now, to be fair, the first hour is usually like we're just on the entire time. And then the next couple of hours, some of the segments will re-air. But I think something, maybe news dropped or something to that effect. And so we couldn't leave. <laughs> and man, I I have a small bladder as it is. Like, I know uh-huh. that's TMI, but like, uh, you know, I drink one coffee and I got to like, I immediately need to head yeah. to the restaurant. <laughs> that, Same. That could not happen. And I was struggling with a capital <laughs> S. It was awful like you could like i you, i probably if you look at look back at it i'm probably like shaking at the desk <laughs> and i'm just like on the on the final on cam i'm uh-huh. just like all right goodbye everyone see you later and i'm just like say grab my papers and and just you know do the whole like put them in order and then, then throw them into the recycling bin and then beeline it to the bathroom because mm-hmm. like, i can't hold it like this is it enough is enough like i'm done that was like a oh yeah that was rough and we- it, I don't wish that upon anyone, by the way. Like it is. Yeah, no, <laughs> we all have those moments. Tease, when I, tease when I had Kenny for, me for that moment. Yeah. When I had Kenny on here, Kenny always said to, to stay away from the, the hot dogs in Montreal. Apparently those are dangerous. When oh make, man. Make okay. I, I did not know that. And I yeah. shall, I definitely will. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I love asking that question. I mean, everyone can relate to, to every stuff, single you know? look. If, 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 if anyone on the air, Johnny tells you that that's never happened to them. They are lying through mm-hmm. their teeth. I agree. Everybody on the air has, has a story like this. Everyone. <laughs> even, you know, even I do. I've, I've had to stop yeah. a zoom before. You oh. know, and thank God it's not you. Thank God I'm good right now. We're, yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I got one, I got one more fun one, um, to ask you. I, I got a couple more questions if that's okay. Of course. Um, I know we've been going a little long here, but, oh, no. um, I like to like think outside the box with like um, merging sports. Um, you know, I, I like to hear um, some of my favorite broadcasters, like you know Charles Barkley, talk about the NHL when he's on NBA and TNT. I think it's really cool how he admires playoff hockey, and um, you know Charles is one of the guys I have in mind that would I would love to like listen to call an NHL game. 
Um, are there any people that you admire not in the game of hockey? Like, I know you're a big combat sport guy. I actually love Ariel Hawani. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. a fan of his, but anyone that comes to mm -hmm. mind for you to maybe like call an ESPN NHL game. I mean, Mike Breen for me is another one. I think he'd be sick. I think like any broadcasters like to that level, like uh -huh. Mike Breen, Doris Burke, Doris uh, you know, too. of that, of that like ilk, when you get to a certain level, I think that you can learn the mechanics of doing yeah. a game. It's at the end of the day, like, we have a lot of even even NHL and ESPN. You have people like Sean McDonough, Bob Wachuz, and like they do multiple sports and they're yeah. really good at it, right? Um, I think once you get to a certain level, I mean, Kenny's a great example. He's yeah, he does all four sports like everywhere. He's, he's incredible, <laughs> yeah. right? Like so, I I think one thing I would love to see from hockey, and there have been people that have occupied this role in the past. I wonder who the Stephen A. of hockey is going to be. <sighs> I love that you said that because I love you know, Stephen A. and I want it to happen so bad. I I I I, do, I loved the hockey content that Stephen A. did uh -huh. uh, leading up to the the season. I, I hope that there's uh, more to come. I mean, I don't I, I don't work with Stephen A. Uh, and I would love. I I I think it was hilarious when he was doing his top fives. Yeah, and you know, like I would love nothing more than to see Stephen A. Um, you know, rag on Maple Leafs fans the way he does Cowboys fans, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. how about them Maple Leafs instead of wearing a cowboy hat, he's wearing one of those like Canadian, yeah. like a toque or a toque. like a, yeah, like a, a Canadian, um, you know, a fur hat or whatever, you know, uh -huh. uh, I would love that because I think that he would knock it out of the park with, with to that point, though, I would love to see who would occupy a role like that. I think that's one area. Mm -hmm. And and look, I'm not saying that it's somebody that you would agree with. The, the best part of people like Stephen A and people who have very strong opinions and deliver them in an entertaining way is that you don't always agree with them. Yeah. You either love the take, you hate the take, but you respect the take and you want to hear what they have to say. And I think that there is a there is room for that kind of broadcaster mm -hmm. for hockey and no, I mean, and and I, and I wonder where that's going to you can't like if i were to ask you who's the stephen a of hockey i don't think that there would be one unanimous answer among hockey fans right now i think most people would just say barry melrose only because he's been on espn for all these years that's sure. that's like he's not the one that's going to like cause that kind of uh so there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot of people yeah barry's amazing i've i've worked with him for years now he's amazing mm -hmm. i think i i think i think that there are a lot of people like barry and barry mm -hmm. is absolutely one of them where you respect their opinions because they've been in hockey for so long and they've been doing this for a very long time and so you absolutely want to hear what they have to say yeah I, no doubt about it i i'm not disputing that whatsoever no, so, I, I, yeah, no, I'm, I, I think, I'm, I think what I'm yeah. wondering is like coming from a place of like, like the, the, the passionate take. Yeah. I that's guess, that's so what I was saying. Like Barry, Barry obviously like knows everything he's talking about, but I just don't get like fired up, you know, like Stephen A could talk about anything and it's must watch TV. Like, you know, it's just, just how it is. But, Whether you um, love it or you hate it, yeah. you watch it. Right. Like that's the thing. And, and, and it's, it's a it's a polarizing figure in hockey. We've had that in the past, yeah, uh, in in hockey. But I wonder where that will come from. Yeah, it's I funny guess. too because Max Kellerman, I, like, is another one that I love. And there's one take that I'll just never let, like, not that I know him, but I'll never let him live down. It's the uh, him saying that UFC is one of the four main sports in the U.S. and hockey's the outside. Hockey's the fifth. Like, it wasn't a top four sport. I was like, that UFC is definitely. I mean, listen, I love. But it's the not UFC. A team sport I think though. It's definitely Sure, but it is a it is a very popular sport. Yeah. I, I don't like people that say it's not a sport. It absolutely is a sport, mm -hmm. but it is uh it it's definitely I mean it's experience exponential it's massive. growth. Yeah, it's absolutely massive. it's experience exponential growth, especially in popularity. So no, I I mean I I I I think that I it, it'll take a while for the UFC to break the top four. I mean, you know, popularity, whatever the case may be, but for for people to say that it's not a sport is is ludicrous. No, I completely, I mean they train like athletes. They're athletes. Like I, I they I, are even, athletes. Yeah. They are. It's just it's, people now. Whether you a, a, appreciate combat sports or not, that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But the UFC is absolutely a sport. That there's no there's no debate about that.
I consider there Joey is. Chestnut to be an athlete. <laughs> I, I'm, be, I'm being dead. I'm dead serious. He's the goat. Actually, I'm, de- okay? I'm dead serious. Let's, yeah. Let us. We cannot say the 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 divine name of Joey Chestnut and not put the correct respect on that name. Yeah. Okay. The goat. The greatest. But don't you agree? The I think and chips speak for themselves. Don't you agree though? If you're the competing for a, a physical um, competition. You should be considered an athlete. We're 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 really veering now. When we're gonna be talking about is golf a sport? Is this yeah. a sport? Is that a sport? Yeah. All right. Well, let me let me ask you one final question <laughs> then. Let me uh let me go back here. But um, you know, I know you're obviously um, you know, someone who takes a lot of pride in their heritage. Um, mm-hmm. I believe you're Muslim Canadian, correct? Mm-hmm. So yes, a guy like Nazim Kadri, as we talk right now, it's Tuesday night. Um, I think it's the eleventh. Um, he's fourth in points in, in the NHL. And for you, how cool is that to see? Because I know for me, I grew up as a Jewish kid on Long Island. Adam Fox is a good friend of mine. And to see him like win the Norris Trophy as the first Jewish kid to ever win like a major NHL award was so cool. And there's so much pride in the Jewish community, especially where I'm from. But, you know, you being a Muslim Canadian in Toronto, I know he played for Toronto. I think he's from Toronto as well. It's got to be super cool for you to watch his success this year. To, to your point, Zach Hyman, too. He's yep. uh, He's been uh, great. He's also a big gamer, too. He actually yeah. owns an esports team. Uh, but he's really? uh, very proud. Yeah, he, I know he, he owns an that. esports team. Uh, when he was in Toronto, I think it, uh, I forget the name of it, Eleven's Esports. Anyway, whatever the name is, he <laughs> definitely owns an esports team. That's how we first started talking, actually, was uh, so because cool. he was a big gamer. He got involved with a lot of events, but then he put together his own teams. He was looking for like Fortnite players, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, also uh, very proud of his background, uh, as, as everyone should be. People should absolutely be proud. Uh, of where they come from and their backgrounds. And honestly, in the case of uh, uh, Nazem Kadri, I think it's fantastic. Like one thing that I love so much is, and, and this is to a much smaller scale than a professional athlete playing in, a, in the biggest league that they possibly can. Like whenever I receive a message from someone that's like, wow, I saw your name on television or I saw you on SportsCenter and like, I didn't know that, people like us could even dream to do a job like this. Like Mm -hmm. growing up, I didn't have many role models that were of the same background as me, or this is the same faith as me. Like it was really Muhammad Ali, right? There weren't many other people that you could look up to and say, I can do that. If they can do it, I can do it as well. And that's so important. Imagine how many people of Arabic descent, Lebanese descent of Muslim faith, uh, how many kids across North America, maybe the world, that see Kadri on the back of a jersey and they get inspired because Nazem Kadri is doing it. And Nazem Kadri uh, is a Lebanese Canadian and he's Muslim. And he has a similar backstory to them and a similar cultural background. And they get inspired because they've heard those names before. And it's like, wow, I can do this too. And I'm going to be just like him one day. Like that's powerful. It's very, yeah. very important, you know? And that uh, we, we, for, for all the conversation, yes, listen, diversity, inclusion, it absolutely matters. And yes, we have a ways to go in hockey, but these are success stories. And, and for him to be part of the Hockey Diversity Alliance, and mm-hmm. that video was extremely powerful. And, and there was, a, I think it was at the 25 second mark, where uh, Kadri's looking at his phone and he gets that text message, that hit me really hard because yeah. I've gotten messages like that. I've been called that word that was in that text message. That didn't, I, that, that wasn't fun. Like yeah. it stung, it sticks with me. It sticks with people when they receive slurs like that, when they get called things like that. And that's not cool. I'm sure that many people watching this have a similar experience. And all you want to do is you want to play hockey or you want to, make friends and, and be in a, in, in a fun environment, an inclusive, a safe environment where you can be yourself and you can talk about hockey, play hockey, the, the barriers to entry uh, low so that you can get involved, right? And so that, that hit me extremely hard. I'm very proud of Nazem that he's involved in, the, in, in that diversity alliance and for everyone else involved uh, up and down, you know, Anthony Duclair, Akeem Aliou, uh, Matt Dumba, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, for me personally, I'm very proud to see it. I would love to do a segment with Nazem Kadri one day because I don't think we've ever seen a segment where a Muslim host and a Muslim player are talking about hockey on a show about hockey. 
Yeah. For me, that would be a dream come true because that would just further be a further example of this is possible, you know? And mm-hmm. so, you know, for, for look, look at us. We are uh, someone of yeah. Muslim faith and someone of Jewish faith talking about hockey on a podcast. Like that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Like that's this, like, this is a perfect example of, 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 of what hockey culture should be and, mm-hmm. and what, what, you know, like, and I hope that people see this and say, yeah, like sometimes it's going to be, th- th- there's always bad apples everywhere, mm-hmm. but we can't let them outnumber the good and we can't let them spoil the entire scene. We have to be diligent and we have to stamp it out and we have to be agents for change and positivity because that's how we're going to grow. Yeah. No, I mean, that that was beautifully said. And seriously, I I admire your passion and just everything about you. I mean, obviously I've been watching you on TV for a long time, but like actually talking to you like one-on-one is, I mean, I'm going to watch you on TV now and it's going to be like so much cooler just to like say that I know you. Like, Oh yeah. It was that guy talking about holding it in on sports center for, yeah, exactly. Now I'm going to really well. I'm going to be, I'm going to tweet at you. Looks like you're going to shit your pants. (laughs) You're going to be um, like, are you holding it in right now? You're going to be like, you're going to be like texting. Are you, are you holding it in right now? Yeah. Oh, well, you know. Funny. But um, <laughs> Art, I seriously, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And I, I like hate that I have to even hang up with you, but I would love to um, definitely have you on maybe toward like playoff time and stuff. Oh but yeah, please. I wanna, anytime. I also want to give you like a moment to, you know, plug anything that you work on or your Twitter handle or your Instagram, um, anything like that. Yeah, sure. Follow me on Twitter at Arda, A-R-D-A. Uh, and let me know. Uh, if there's anything you disagree with that, that we <laughs> talked about on this podcast, uh, the ultimate battleground, the, the the most honorable of battlegrounds, as we all know, is Twitter. So please mm-hmm. uh, find me there. I'm also not going to lie. This has been the most like just variety of topics that I've ever talked about on an episode. We, yeah, we, from, we bounced around we really like, did. the metaverse, <laughs> NFTs, yeah. virtual reality. We're sitting at MSG with, uh-huh. with helmets on, with VR helmets on and uh, we're smelling MSG popcorn and stuff. Wow, this is what a trip, Johnny. Good job. My dad, my dad listens to every single episode. He's gonna talk to me at dinner after we <laughs> listen. He's be like, I never heard you talk about any of that shit before. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, what? Do you, yeah, like, what? What is going on here? Yeah, what are you yeah. talking about that's so your dad funny. probably has one of these. He, he probably, probably has does. One stashed yeah. somewhere. My parents still have a, a VCR machine in their room. They haven't gotten the flat screen. <laughs> yeah. They still have the box TV. It's crazy. <laughs> the yeah, the tube TV yeah. with the knobs. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But um, <laughs> all right. Seriously, thank you so much, and um, definitely want to keep in touch and everything. Yeah, absolutely, Johnny. Thanks for having me.